Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another one of the Military Aviation Museum's ongoing series of webinars. I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum. Ian McLaughlin, our speaker tonight, is a historian, an author, a tutor, and even a TV presenter um, who has a special affinity for the Mighty 8th Air Force. Uh, he's been involved in a number of aircraft excavations, and we'll be talking about some of them tonight, including, I think, a, a Hawker Hurricane that was shot down by Adolf Galland. Is, is that right, Ian? Are you there? Good evening. Yes, I'm here, and you're correct. Yes, we will talk about Adolf Galland's victory a little later on. Well, um, hmm. since we've got you loud and clear, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started, Ian. Thanks for being here. Okay. Well, good good evening. Well, in fact, actually, it's just gone midnight over here, so uh, good morning, I should say. We're going to discuss the Battle of Britain, but it's a very, very big subject. And what I wanted to do was to go through the lead up to the Battle of Britain, an overview of the Battle of Britain, and then a couple of personal stories on aviation archaeology linked to the Battle of Britain. So without further ado, I will push the button and move on. Well, firstly, okay. I wanted to explain to everybody where East Anglia is. Uh, even in the UK, people do argue about it. And you can see on the screen there, wartime East Anglia, the number of bases, airfields, aerodromes in East Anglia, there were hundreds of them, both British and American. And my own particular interest is because we had something in the region of 400,000 American airmen over here on over 100 different bases. And I got involved in all of this because I recovered the wreckage of a flying fortress bomber. That's a different story. Where I live, you will see a little arrow coming down from the word Beckles on the screen there and it stops approximately where I live, the town of Beckles, not on the map, but pretty much on the border between 11 group and 12 group. We'll explain a little more about the groups further on. Uh, next slide, Keegan, please. Pre-war, period 39 to 40, building up to that, the British had a civil defence organisation, Air Aid Precaution formed, and it was a part of the Home Office. We viewed then, as we sometimes do now, I think, France as the potential enemy. But Germany came the threat as that decade went on from the 20s into the 1930s. The British started to rearm very rapidly about 35, 1935. And in 1937, the British air staff reckoned that, that we would receive 600 tonnes of bombs per day with 200,000 casualties a week. We expected 66,000 people to be killed every week. And those estimates actually got larger. Reality, of course, at the end of the war, the British had lost 66,000 people, true, but over the entire war period. But we were very reluctant to rearm. Many of the people in senior positions then remembered the slaughter in the trenches in the First World War. And it, it, like America, America had experienced that it did not look, and neither did the British, towards another war. Hitler thought differently. Guernica, 1937, the use of mass bombing and the Condor Legion gave the nascent Luftwaffe an awful lot of experience that we will discuss a little further on. Next slide, please. There was a saying back then that the bomber will always get through, and it originated in British Parliament, November 1932, when the Prime Minister, 
Prime Minister Stan, Stanley Baldwin said he, he thought it was as well for the man in the street to realise there is no power on earth that will prevent him from being bombed. The bomber will always get through. Now those aficionados of strategic bombing will of course remember in America, Billy Mitchell over here, Frenchard, Duhay in Italy and so on. The idea was very powerful then of the bomber over defenseless cities. So the British tried to regulate what was becoming a very aggressive Germany by what we called appeasement. It was negotiation. It was trying to keep Hitler happy. But at the same time, it was important then it began realized Churchill in particular was saying there will be war so we abandoned what was the 10-year rule which had been in place since 1919 when the British government said to itself that there will not be a war inside any rolling decade and they abandoned it because they suddenly realized that in 1935 the war would not start in 1945 it was getting a lot closer. And clearly the flexing of the muscles by Japan and Germany showed that they were the potential aggressors. Next slide, Keegan. And this little cartoon shows the spineless leaders of democracy. This is in essence what appeasement was about. And Hitler, in many ways, laughed and scoffed at Chamberlain with his umbrella and at really the spineless leaders of democracy. He was flexing aggressively those muscles of totalitarianism and it, it all we could do was, was almost become supplicants as he saw it. Next slide. The preparations went ahead and the one thing about the Battle of Britain was a battle of Britain. It was not just in the air. Of course it was in the air as we will see that the difference between victory and defeat was finalised. But the preparations, governments and local governments, and you, I, I guess you have this in America, who's going to pay for what? And the Air Aid Precaution Act of 1937 basically came from central, central government and told the local government that you are going to have to pay for it. So in 1937, they formed a warden service, 12 regions in the country, and we asked for street wardens, people that as the bombs rained down would guide and help members of the public to find air raid shelters, to calm them down, to report the bomb falls, where the roads were blocked, gas mains had exploded, water mains broken and so on. They were wanted now, back in 1937. Next slide, please. The Home Office very helpfully suggested that we needed 20 million square feet of timber for coffins and 2.8 million hospital beds. And of course, war is costly. And the government said uh, it came up with 25,000 pounds per bomb. What that was in dollars, they were about $4 to the pound back then. And it was 550 million pounds destruction in the first three weeks. Now, surprisingly, records exist that show you the costs of the different raids that took place. It didn't get as bad as that, but it was certainly bad. Next slide. If you smoked, and many people did in those days, you could very helpfully get cigarette cards, as we call them, and you had them in America as well. And this preparations from a cigarette packet. Uh, we would say over here it's a fag packet because you would smoke a fag, a cigarette, different meaning in other parts of the world. 1935, Baldwin's government put 100,000 for civil defence planning. We needed to expand our fire service. 
there would be what became known as Operation Pied Piper, the evacuation procedures for children, and measures particularly against uh, bombing and gas attack. Next slide. And it was a tremendous fear because gas was one of the horrific weapons used by both sides during the First World War. And it was a fear that many people expected to be gassed as the Second World War started. And the British had gas weaponry, so did the Americans, so did the uh, Germans and the Japanese. I believe the only ones that uh, engaged in its use were the Japanese. But in Britain in 1939, we were preparing for gas attacks, although the young lad in this uh, picture not very well prepared. Next one. The other thing that needed to be recruited, ambulance drivers. And many of these came from what would be upper class women because they were the only women back in the 1920s and 1930s who had been able to afford to learn to drive. But it definitely was not a role for the squeamish. And one of the people I had the privilege of meeting in America, strangely enough, was a lady called Betty Ford, who had been a GI bride married an American but before that she had driven ambulances during the blitz she had raced even as the bombs were falling and she had seen and undertaken some pretty ghastly work picking up pieces of people trying to help those badly wounded in the bombing so it wasn't a role for the squeamish next slide please and there is an air raid warning warden he's radiating importance and some of these people did you know they were sort of what we would call jobs worth a black tin helmet an armband an air raid warning whistle and they actually had a wooden rattle or a handbell and they would run around shouting air raid and yes they were laughed at on on many occasions but when the bombs did drop and people were dying and cities were ablaze many of these volunteers were heroes during that time next slide please and here churchman's cigarettes it wasn't like this a chain of buckets calm organized well of course when the water mains have been blown apart and you can't get any water to the fire hydrants to get the pumps going then it is chaos and dead and wounded laying in the streets and those nations that experienced bombing and the british certainly did london for example after the battle of britain 57 consecutive nights of air raids next slide we also set up something called the WVS, the Women's Voluntary Service. War was anticipated and the nation had to go to war. It had a million members, mobile canteens, and you will notice that the canteen there in this particular image is provided as a gift from the American Red Cross. And they would distribute clothes and food, and of course, for the British, copious quantities of tea because as a country we ran on tea and still pretty much do well at least i do next one they had to recruit women into the air raid precaution service and these women would be aiding civilians during air raids and after air raids emergency rest centers where food stocks had been destroyed provisioning food first aid evacuation and billeting of children from the towns and cities under operation pied piper as when when the war broke out we evacuated hundreds of thousands of children to areas where it felt it would be safer next slide please <laughs> 
Now, I mentioned civil defence. You can see in this map the UK. Without going into too much detail, you can see highlighted their civil defence regions. So each of these regions was set up with headquarters and subdivisions preparing for the war that everybody now knew was coming. Next slide, please. Something else as well. The Observer Corps had been formed in 1925. This is way before the days of radar. And in recognition of their courage and achievements during the Battle of Britain, they were renamed the Royal Observer Corps by King George VI. And these were dedicated men and women who were responsible for tracking enemy aircraft. We will talk later about radar, but you have to remember that the minute enemy aircraft crossed the coast, they were behind the radar. The radar only looked seawards. So the whole structure, the infrastructure of tracking enemy bombers, hundreds of them, and many, many raids would be the Observer Corps or the RT, the radio telephones on the aircraft using high frequency transmission. Each Spitfire or Hurricane had its HF set to what was called pipsqueak. So it would automatically send out a signal. So that would be triangulated from Observer Corps and other posts so they could track where our British aircraft were to try and put them in contact with the enemy aircraft. Next slide. And here you can see the classic map. Plotters wearing headset, constant communications linked, which would be with a cluster of observer core posts, usually three. And this, along with the heroism of the telephone engineers, these guys were also out. It was vital in those days that you had to protect and bury deeply your communication telephone wires. Sometimes they were hit and a lot of courage was shown by the post office engineers fixing them even as the bombs fell. Next slide. Here you've got something that the Observer Corps used, a Micklethwaite height adjuster. And you can see there, basically, it's over, it's on the top tower of a plotting station. And it would indicate the approximate height. You would look up the sighting bar. It would then adjust and you could see the vertical pointer in the middle of the map there. And as you move this around, it would show the approximate position of the aircraft on the map grid on the table there. So you would have to identify it as, a, as in this case, a, a 109 or a 110, how many of them, which direction they were going, how high, etc. Next slide. You then report the map coordinates, the height, the time, the sector clock code, because they had a particular design of coloured clock that changed every five minutes. And when a raid was reported, it was given a number, it was given a colour code and then they could be tracked much more effectively and they would be then the plotters that we saw on the sighting and the marking table back a few slides ago would be plotting these aircraft heinkels coming in next slide air marshal hugh dowding said it is important to note that they constituted the whole means of tracking enemy raids once they crossed the coastline their work was invaluable and without it we could not have made the number of inland interceptions that the raf was able to do next slide The British Armed Forces, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force grew man and woman power. Women's Auxiliary Air Force, September 1939, 1,500 aircraft women, 234 officers. It rose to nearly 176,000 with almost 6,000 officers by July 1943. And here you can see them getting a barrage balloon up into the skies. 
Next slide. It was said, of course, that it was only these balloons that kept Britain afloat. Take those out and the island would sink. Now, having had a look at some of the infrastructure that was gearing up for this forthcoming, we didn't know what it would be called, but it was called the Battle of Britain. And it's some say apparently the only battle that's been named before it actually happened in Church's famous, Churchill's famous speech about the fall of France and now we're preparing for the Battle of Britain. What aircraft did we actually have? So we'll have a look at some of the aircraft of the era leading in to the Second World War. Next slide. Perhaps the most famous or one of the most famous, the Hurricane, Sir Sidney Cam, born in Windsor, close to London, Windsor Castle, may have been seen by many American visitors, the eldest of 12 children, off to the Royal Free School, then an apprentice carpenter and fascinated and making model aircraft, including a not very successful man-carrying glider. He worked for Martinside Aircraft Company at Brooklands and then joined Hawker Aircraft in 1923. And his first design was the aircraft at the bottom there on the right, a tiny little machine for the, um, uh, for the period, 1923. Next slide, please. To me, one of the most graceful aircraft of that era was the Hawker Fury. And with Fred Sigrist, Hawker's MD, Cam developed metal construction of aircraft. Bear in mind, of course, back then, uh, before the 1930s, primarily wood. He made and designed 52 different aircraft, and he had 26,000 of his machines manufactured during the 1930s. In fact, 84%, as I've mentioned there, of RAF aircraft were of CAM design, the Hawker Fury fighter, the Hawker Hart bomber. They were stunning looking aircraft, but they would not be up to it, of course, by 1939. Next slide. Cam, very difficult man to work for, but he was a brilliant engineer, an aeronautical engineer, and you could learn a tremendous amount from him, but you had to show that you were learning because he did not suffer fools gladly. And there is a photograph I took at Duxford of Hawker Nimrod, still flying there today. There are a few of these machines gracing the skies. Thanks to people like those of you who are involved with the museums who keep these machines flying for the benefit of us all. And my thanks to you. Next slide. Perhaps his most famous aircraft, of course, the Hurricane. First flew November 1935, and it was a bridge design because there were those within the British Air Ministry who felt that the leap in technology to the monocoque fuselage of the Spitfire might be just a leap too far. So the Hurricane had fundamentally the same structure as his earlier biplanes. That, of course, meant that you were taking far less of a technological risk. Equally, your ground crews would be familiar with the Hawker Fury or the Heart or the Demon, and that meant that the structure would be within their comfort zone. You could also make hurricanes a lot faster than you could do the Spitfires at the time. Next slide. The early uh, hurricane was actually called the Hawker Fury monoplane. It had some of the earlier type of armament, uh, guns on the side fuselage synchronized to fire through the propeller, but tests carried out during the 1930s against aircraft aluminium or aluminum structure indicated that the 
two stroke four machine guns would not do the trick. You needed at least eight guns. And of course, we all know that even they, by the end of the Battle of Britain, were deemed less effective than cannon. You also had, of course, the marriage of the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Next slide. And this is the Hurricane prototype, November 1935, flown by George Borman. Next slide. XRFC, he flew SE5s and Snipes, a Hawker test pilot for 20 years and a friend of Sydney Cam's, died in 1967. Always or often pictured with his inevitable pipe, a very, very talented airman. Next slide. The hurricane, of course, overshadowed by the Spitfire and Battle of Britain, 60% of the aerial victories were hurricanes. 14 and a half thousand of them built and it served in the deserts and the jungles throughout the Second World War. Before we had Rosie the Riveter, there we've got Winnie Bennett, Dolly Bennett, Florence Simpson, hurricane production at the factory in Langley. Next slide. Hurricanes, if you wanted to buy one today, would set you back a cool one and a half plus maybe two million pounds. What's that going to be? I don't know, three, three and a half million dollars. But when we were doing the uh, film series, Plane Resurrection, we went into Hawker Restorations in Suffolk where they're rebuilding hurricanes. And it was noted again, of course, one of the things about the hurricane, the bullets would go through the fabric and take greater punishment than punching into the fuselage of a Spitfire. Next slide. And just so in case you're wondering who this voice is and what he looks like, that's me on the right hand side there. Uh, when we were filming the hurricane story for Plane Resurrection, which I'm told is available uh, on Amazon in the States. Now, of course, there are fewer hurricanes around than the Spitfires. Next slide, please. Following the hurricane, Cam went on, he did the Hawker Hunter, graceful, beautiful jet, and then, of course, the Harrier, vertical takeoff and landing. And when he died of a heart attack, he was actually planning an aircraft design capable of traveling at Mark IV. So one of Britain's greatest aeronautical en engineers. Next slide. The other one associated, of course, with the Battle of Britain, R.J. Mitchell born in Kidsgrove Staffs, which is about the middle of the country. Grammar school, model aircraft, and like Cam, mad about aeroplanes. At 16, he went into a locomotive, a railway, a train engineering works, then into the drawing office, and he worked hard studying night school, maths, engineering. Next slide. 1917. Supermarine Southampton, seaplanes, flying boats. But they could see the genius that was within this young man. He became the chief designer in 1919 and chief engineer 1920. And by 1927, he was the technical director of the business. He was responsible for aircraft like the trophy winning Sea Lion One down there. Next slide. And perhaps most famously, the S series of seaplane racers. He was so highly regarded that when Vickers took over Supermarine, one of the conditions they set in 1928, that Mitchell had to stay for at least five years. In the period 1920 to 36, he did a number of aircraft and they were not all graceful and brilliant. His first design of the Spitfire, a gull wing fixed uh, undercarriage aircraft, was a pretty ugly looking beast. He's also responsible for the Supermarine Walrus. While not the most graceful of aircraft, was one of the best for SE rescue. 
but S4, S5 and S6 racers. And that's him underneath the wing wearing the plus four trousers as they're working on the S6. Next slide, please. If anybody ever tells you anything about an aeroplane, which is so bloody complicated, you can't understand it, take it from me, it's all balls. That's what he said to Jeffrey Quill, the Spitfire test pilot. So he could be quite to the point when he needed to be. Next slide. He dodged fame publicity, not well known outside aviation circles, but very, very well loved by those that worked for him. He earned their respect, uh, their loyalty and affection. And he in turn was devoted to, to his staff, but tragically 1933 diagnosed with cancer, a colostomy, a major operation, and he was dying. His colleagues never knew. Next slide, please. He would not contemplate rest or retirement. He knew, as so many did, that war was coming and that we would need Spitfires aplenty. He had to finish this design, even though he knew he was dying. When he died, the Spitfire design was handed on to Joe Smith and a design team that carried it through succeeding generations of an excellent fighter aircraft. Next slide. He died in Hazeldean, Southampton, 1937, aged only 42. Next slide. Matt Summers took the Spitfire prototype up March 1936. Total production of Spitfires and Seafire variants around 22,789. Figures sometimes vary, but what an aircraft. Next slide, please. Now, Joe Mutt Summers, don't touch a single thing, he reputedly said after he landed the Spitfire following its first flight. There were no major snags, but even an aircraft without major snags would need a lot of testing. Next slide. And people say, why did they call him Mutt? Well, he had the habit pre takeoff of christening any aircraft by peeing on its tail wheel, like a dog, like a Mutt marking its territory. And he got the nickname Mutt because of this. It was a I suppose a superstition. It was lucky if you read on it. I don't know what the ground crew would have thought about it, but there we go. Next slide. Of course, the Spitfire became an icon. It and the Hurricane were vital. But what was going on in Hitler's Germany? Next slide. Well, Taking us back to the 1920s, the Treaty of Versailles banned single engine fighter type aircraft, restrictions on what they could build and fly in the Weimar Republic through the 20s and 30s, but suddenly there was this tremendous interest in gliding. Next slide. The German government created some 50,000 glider pilots by 1937. And they very much were the core for the, at the time, of Ian, are you there? I think we may have lost you. I can hear you. Oh, we can hear you now again. Uh, perhaps if you'll take it from the 50,000 glider pilots. OK, will do then. You got me now? Next slide, please. Germany had been, in a sense, preparing for a war for some time. 1922, the Treaty of Rapallo, where the Germans and the Russians, in a sense, both pariah states at the time, as far as the rest of the world was concerned, renounced all their 
claims from the First World War, territorial and financial, on each other. And here you can see the Chancellor of Germany with the Russian negotiators on this Treaty of Rapallo. Next slide, please. They agreed to normalize diplomatic relations and to cooperate in a spirit of mutual goodwill in meeting the ec economic needs of both countries. Now, they are very strange bedfellows. Communism and what would eventually become totalitarianism, fascism. Next slide, please. Following the Treaty of Rapallo with the Bolsheviks, and in complete violation of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany set up a flying school at Lipetsk in Russia during the 1920s and early 1930s. Some 200 German fighter pilots and ground personnel trained in Soviet Russia. Next slide, please. The Fokker D-13 fighters were actually shipped from Holland to fulfill an order for, in quotes, Argentina, which is actually Russia. And the British were duped into providing the engines, the Napier Lion engines for these fighters. Next slide, please. And the German pilots, and here you can see them looking very much like airmen, not. They were disguised as tourists and the passports were issued to fictitious names and they were given civilian clothes or sometimes Russian uniforms, but stripped of all insignia. Next slide, please. In German documents, Lipetsk is called the Scientific Aviation Testing Station, and they tested a number of new warplanes because they couldn't be doing this with the Allies under the Treaty of Versailles looking down on them. But in Russia, they could. Next slide. Ernst Heinkel, his Heinkel 17, my first airplane for the Reichswehr, built in secrecy. He played cat and mouse with the Allied Commission on Aircraft Construction, who were spot checking factories. Well, they weren't spot checking them in Russia. They also tested the use of poison gas from aircraft out in Russia as well. Next slide. If there were casualties, and there are in aviation, bodies returned to Germany in coffins marked machinery parts. They're actually just in boxes. So these machinery parts, should some unfortunate German airmen turn up in uh, the sort of state as we see at the bottom here, then that's how he would be returned to Germany. They were also told that if the media got hold of any of these casualties, they were to have died in a sport plane accident. Next slide. October 22, Junkers secretly established a factory in Russia, a Philly. But there were difficulties. Their work didn't meet expectations, partly because of the reluctance by the Germans to manage it, and partly because the Russian bureaucracy it didn't give what the Russians wanted, which was they wanted to steal some of Junkers' modern aircraft technology, and Junkers weren't too keen on giving this. But there was a sort of strange cooperation there. Next slide. Junkers, Hugo Junkers, he wasn't honest. He was busy siphoning money off from both the governments and setting up other projects in Turkey particularly. Another problem they genuinely faced was a shortage of duralumin because the supplies, French spies got wind of what was going on and through the French government then restricted supplies which came from the French zone of occupied Germany and that helped handicap what we knew or the French knew was going on in Russia at that time. Next slide. Duralumin, the German metallurgist Alfred Wim, and there he is, uh, 1903. He found out that if after quenching you left aluminum alloy with 4% copper in it, it hardened at room temperature after several days. 
and further refinements gave us duralumin, which was, of course, the foundation for all metal aircraft that started really in the First World War, but came to the fore much more strongly in the 1930s. Next slide. And here we have in General Lieutenant Wilhelm Schubert. He was the boss of the Philly plant, but he hated the Russians. And the combination of his hatred and Russian red tape plus changing politics meant that the factory, in a sense, didn't achieve what was planned for either side. Next slide. They closed the school just before Hitler came to power. But the one thing both sides did get out of this was some knowledge of aircraft production and production techniques by the Russians. And of course, for the Germans, a core, a cadre of skilled pilots, which of course would be absorbed into the new Luftwaffe. Next slide, please. And of course, that came from the combination of Adolf Hitler and Hermann Goring. And Hitler in the 1930s completely outwitted the Franco-British uh, alliance. And they reoccupied the Rhineland. They, they didn't really have the su substance, but they had the bluff and they got away with it. They rebuilt their armed forces. 1936, as I mentioned, remilitarized the Rhineland. 1938, annexed Austria and chunks of Czechoslovakia and took the rest over in 1939. Next slide. Now, the one thing looking back at what was going on in the 1930s, if you were a dictator, i.e. Mussolini, Adolf Hitler, fundamentally, people did what you told them to do. If you were a democratic government, i.e. Uh, Roosevelt, or in the British case, Chamberlain, but talking about America, America, many had sympathy for Britain in the early days of the war, but America had the same problems. Roosevelt suddenly could not rearm because many Americans, like many British, were very reluctant in the 1930s to rearm. Whereas in Germany, you did what you were told. Next stage. Next slide, please. Five years after the last occupying troops disappeared out of the Rhineland and occupied Germany, Hitler and Goring unwrapped the new Luftwaffe. 11,000 men, 1,800 aircraft, many of them under the guise of flying clubs with sports and mail planes the Heinkel 51, as you can see, and the ME 109. Um, sport planes, definitely not. Next slide. The Heinkel 111, 1935, was sold off, uh, really presented as a civilian transport, but of course, easily converted to a bomber. Upwards of 6,000 built, quite slow, and frankly, it went way beyond its sell-by date in Luftwaffe service. Next slide. The Dornier 17 flying pencil was a commercial transport and demonstrated in 1935, British and French fighters couldn't catch the thing. It showed them a clean pair of heels and that alarmed more than ever the airmen in Britain and in France and in other countries in, in Europe and even in America, but America itself was slow getting aircraft into production, aircraft of the right quality for World War II. Next slide. Dornier 17, 1934, upwards of 2,000 built, 2,000 pounds of bombs. One of the difficulties with this Luftwaffe was the fact that it was not a strategic bombing force. It was fundamentally a long range cannon supporting the army. It was not flying fortresses and liberators, Lancasters, etc. Next slide. And perhaps the best of the bunch then, the Junkers 88, fast, versatile, 16,000 of them built, 269 miles an hour, 3,000 pounds of bombs, and it could be 
uh, a night fighter, very effective, a bomber, and a very fast bomber during the period of the Battle of Britain. Next slide. The 110, the Messerschmitt 110, or the BF, Bayerisch Flugzeug Worker. Uh, you can call it, I stick with ME because it's easier. First flight, May 36, couple of Daimler Benz engines there. Fastest, 370, two or three crew, cannon and machine guns. But in the Battle of Britain, as we will see, disappointing. Successful as a night fighter. Next slide. And then this one, the Heinkel 112, a propaganda aircraft. It competed with the 109 for Luftwaffe orders. It lost out. They only built 100. But so crafty were the Germans. They convinced the Allies that there were many more of this aircraft around. Next slide. And here is a wartime aircraft recognition card showing the Heinkel 113. It was a fictitious fighter. It was a disinformation exercise, propaganda, and we, the Allies, generally believed it. What the Germans did was they had a number of these. They moved them around, they repainted them, they took photographs and published them in magazines, released to the newspapers. So it looked like you had more aircraft than you actually did. And so convinced were the French and the British and others that there were quite a number of claims for these aircraft being shot down during the early days of World War II. But of course, they weren't shot down, they weren't there. They were 109s, if anything. Next slide, please. And then, of course, the 109. Another little job, the smoke and mirrors, propaganda on speed and numbers. And again, we believed what was being said about these aircraft. Next slide. 1938, the head of the French Air Force, General Villemont, visited Germany. And he was shown round to see this new rebuilt Luftwaffe. And the Germans were quite masterful in this use of propaganda. Next slide. Everywhere he saw huge numbers of modern aircraft parked at the runways. But again, he'd been tricked because he was taken from airport to airport, driven in a motorcade. The aircraft sometimes were then flown from one airport to the other, hastily remarked. So when he inspected more ME-109s or Heinkels, they were in fact the same ones repainted. And when they did speed tests, they showed him how fast the 109 could go. They had it overtake a Junkers 52, but they briefed the JU-52 pilot to go as slow as he possibly could, so it the 109 coming past as fast as it possibly could, the impression was one of tremendous speed. Next slide, please. They even had the BF-109R, which at the uh, international meeting in 1937 with the 60, 150 horsepower engine won speed records. But of course, the engine couldn't last more than about 10 or 12 minutes. It wasn't a practical production thing, but it did again continue the propaganda message. Next slide, please. And again, we look at the 109, 1935, and the, it is apparently the most produced fighter of all time, over 34,000. More importantly, it was superior to the hurricane and very definitely a match for the Spitfire and historians still argue this it's always a good subject to argue what was the better aircraft I'm not stepping into that particular uh, regal patch except to say that the 109 was an aeroplane that was well respected by fighter pilots including the Americans that came along later on in the war next slide the Czech crisis. Britain was not prepared. Chamberlain's further appeasement, peace in our time, he came back and he claimed. But the one thing he did do that has perhaps not been properly recognised is 
he bought time. And the cartoon there, what's Czechoslovakia to me anyway? Well, what was it? But it was the rock that would be holding up the rest and there would be an avalanche when and if it fell. Next slide. In a sense, the British and the French sold Czechoslovakia out. August 1939, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of non-aggression between the two um, totalitarian leaders. But for Hitler, this uh, rather strange marriage cleared the way for him to achieve his initial ambitions. Next slide. We move in now to the start of World War II. Germany invading Poland on the 1st of September 1939. And really tragically, the Russians moving in on Poland on the 17th. And you can see there the German Soviet demarcation line in September 1928. And this was the event that triggered the start of the Second World War. But even some might argue on that, because what if one looks back at the Japanese invasion of China was in the earlier 30s. So when did it begin? But we'll stick with this date, September the 1st, 1939. Next slide, please. We then entered, after Britain had declared war on Germany, a phony war. The British sent an army over there, the British Expeditionary Force. And we thought it would be a war like that of 1914-18. Our equipment, and you can see here Gloucester Gladiator, the last of the biplane, biplane fighters in France. So it looked almost like a setting on a World War I aerodrome. Next slide, please. But that ended abruptly with the Blitzkrieg on the 10th of May 1940, when the Germans punched through the Netherlands and through Belgium and into France, moving fast and hard with Stukas and tanks and a well-equipped Wehrmacht. Next slide. And of course, the Stuka, the aerial demon fitted with screamers, they were quite a loathsome machine if you were on the wrong end of it. Next slide, please. The invasion of the Low Countries, they mercilessly attacked refugee columns. And what they worked on was a basis of flooding the roads with refugees would hinder any Allied advance or indeed retreat because the armies couldn't move freely on roads blocked with terrified and Stuka dive bombing civilian refugees. Next slide. The Dunkirk evacuation, Operation Dynamo, I've mentioned there, in fact, my father was there. He fought as part of the rearguard action, retreating back towards the coast of France. And he said to me, it was a case of fight, retreat, fight, retreat, trying to act as the rearguard holding the armies at bay. And he hated Stukas. He saw what they did to the civilian columns and he, he suffered from what today we would call PTSD for the rest of his life. Next slide. For the Dunkirk survivors, RAF took on a new meaning, rare as fairies is what RAF stood for because they never saw them, but that was not fair. Next slide. June 1940, the last day of Operation Dynamo, the RAF had flown 171 reconnaissance, 651 bombing and nearly 3,000 fighter sorties. They were up there, but they were just not necessarily visible to the men on the beaches. Next slide, please. The nine days, the British had lost 177 aircraft, including 106 vital fighters. The attrition 
was wearing down Fighter Command's strength, such that only 331 Hurricanes and Spitfires were there, with 36 in reserve, and Churchill wanted to send more to France. Dowding wrote a famous letter that resisted this move and managed to dissuade Churchill from sending the numbers of Hurricanes that he'd hoped to send. And had he got his way, we probably would have lost the Battle of Britain. Next slide, please. In the end, we achieved the 338,000 soldiers, British and French, were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk and elsewhere in France. Next slide. But you don't win by retreats. It might have been a miracle, but we left behind 2,472 guns, 65,000 vehicles, 20,000 motorcycles, 416,000 tons of stores, 75,000 tons of desperately needed ammunition, and 162,000 tons of fuel. All left. And there was, when the Germans invaded Russia, there were quite a number of British lorries, British manufactured lorries in the invading army. Next slide, please. It also cost the RAF upwards of a thousand aircraft and 1500 airmen and they went to war in bombers like this fairy battle hopelessly outclassed shot down with a loss of many courageous airmen the only thing that could be said for it is that it was a single engined merlin bomber and the pilots from battle squadrons were very quickly retrained and many flew fighters uh, in the Battle of Britain. Britain stood alone, but did it? Yes, in many ways, but not in others. There were some 14 odd nations in the Battle of Britain. Poles and Czechs particularly had a hatred of the Germans because their countries were occupied, likewise the French. For the Americans, it's, it's quite hard to ascertain exactly how many Americans were there because apparently some of them came over masquerading as Canadians. And uh, that got them high spirited young Americans into the war. And then, of course, there was Canada, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, the British Empire providing airmen and the fleet air arm, the Navy provided airmen and ex bomber pilots as well. Next slide. Seemingly overwhelming odds, but those guys, the few, had good aircraft, as we've seen, the infrastructure we've covered, but one thing we have not yet covered is the chain home stations, radar. Next slide. Sound location, 1920s, 1930s. Unreliable, something better needed. Next slide. Baldsy Manor, not far from where I live, bought for 24,000 to house radar development under Robert Watson Watt. Next slide, please. British physicist, the father of radar. Originally, the British Air Ministry wanted him to develop a weapon in response to rumors of a German death ray, the sort of science fiction stuff. Next slide. He Again, instead, he realized that this death ray thing was a nonsense, but he started to look at radar and he developed the radar system that was the pivotal, that was key to defending Britain. Next slide. The Daventry experiment, 1935. They tried it, two receiving antennas about eight miles from a BBC shortwave station at Daventry. They phased the, the receiver's antennas so that signals coming directly from the station would get cancelled out, but coming in from other angles would be admitted and deflecting a trace onto a cathode ray tube. Next slide. They picked up an RAF Hayford bomber whose crew wondered why they'd been ordered to go round and round in circles in this particular area. There were only three witnesses in their little van, Watson Watt, Arnold Wilkin and A.P. Rowe from the Air Defence Committee. Next slide. 
top priority program once they realized that this worked to build radar stations. And here you can see the taller masts, chain home and chain home low masts for higher altitude and lower altitude. Germany knew something was going on and they sent the Graf Zeppelin over as a, well, the first apparently military electronics reconnaissance sortie to listen for the British. The British kept stumm. They didn't say anything. They watched this thing. They could even tell when it radioed back for a fix on where it was. They knew exactly where it was. And there was some temptation to tell the Germans, that, excuse me, you're not where you think you are. But we didn't. And luckily, with faulty equipment, two or three sorties, the Germans did not get a grip on British radar technology. Next slide, please. And here you can see again the number of radar posts that were built in that frantic period to give complete radar coverage. And you can see on the map on the right hand side how deeply into France and out to sea the radar could go for the chain home high and the chain home low with hopefully catch lower flying, but nothing would catch aircraft at a sort of 100 feet under, not the technology in those days. Next slide, please. So it became the first ground control interception system. We've seen the observer core, we've seen radar, putting information into fighter command Bentley Priory, going out to the group operations rooms, and then going to the sector stations, and then out to the fighter squadrons and the anti-aircraft guns, providing information on German raids and movements. Next slide. And here you can see a lady at Bordsy, in point of fact, her, she's working on a cathode ray tube display. Left hand edge is the pulse from the transmitter and that return signal with the aircraft center screen. The scale at the bottom calculated to 200 miles and she moves the cursor to the position of the trace. The information is then automatically given to a calculator. Next slide. She's got her right hand on a directional a height finding and a left hand working a goniometer, which measures the angle. And that's a setting for the calculator to measure target bearing. She turns the goniometer until the blip disappears and the scale is calibrated in degrees and given to the calculator. So that way you can get the aircraft position, height, speed and approximate numbers. Next slide. It was intense work, stressful work, and they were working one hour on, one hour off because it was so tiring. They had tremendous courage, those operators, and in fact, all the WAFs did. Very often, they were still working as the bombs were raining down on their radar stations. Luckily, as I mentioned, the Germans underestimated the importance of it and did not get a grip on British fighter control. Next slide. We also had different groups, 12 group, 10 group, 11 group there. And the ferocity of the fighting in the Battle of Britain, the bottom section around Canterbury, the Biggin Hill sector there became Hellfire Corner because that summer was a struggle for the survival of democracy. Next slide. There are sort of five phases. The June lull after the German success aided the British. Mid-July, mid-August, battles over the channel. They were testing the defenses. They were supporting and trying to blockade the uh, British Isles. They wanted to weaken the RAF and what were called Kipper patrols were quite costly. They were aircraft going out to protect convoys, but the British were learning. We were learning that our fighting area tactics were not effective, that having a Vic of three aircraft with a weaver in the tail bit, the tail end Charlie was often shot down unnoticed by the remaining aircraft in the Vic. They were too busy concentrating. So we adopted the German Rotter system, which was eventually in essence became the finger four formation, which was used by the British and later on the Americans. Next slide. 
Phase two, August, September, RAF defences. Endlegraf, eagle attack. Goring pompously said that he could defeat the RAF and they allowed something like four days for it. But poor weather held him up. August the 13th became the Adler Tag. August the 12th, their first major effort to not have the doding system, this control system we've just described. They hit four radar stations, three were taken out, but within less than six hours, they were operational again. And finally, in the end, Goring felt that these, these it was pointless going after these because they were too difficult to knock out. Next slide. Luftwaffe strength, circa 3,000 planes, 800 109s, 300 110s, 400 Jun Junkers 87s, 1,500 Heinkels Dorniers, JU-88s against the RAF. Next slide. 52 squadrons, 11, 10, 12, 13 groups, 700 odd hurricanes and spitfires with nearly 300 in reserve. You can always get yourself into difficulties with numbers because they will vary from one set of figures to another, but this is this will give you some idea. Next slide. He thought, as I mentioned, beat the RF four days. They began to believe their own propaganda. They believed themselves. They thought with the numbers of aircraft they were claiming that the RAF was decimated. The reserves had gone. True, they were low, but they were not gone. Aircraft production in the UK was going up. 708 fighters early August with 1,434 pilots. It had gone up. But these young men of whatever nationality were facing a constant companion in the cockpit. That was death. They were 18, 19, 20 years old. It took something around four seconds, sometimes even less, to destroy a fighter. They were sitting atop or in close proximity, and this is 109s as well, to 87 odd gallons of fuel. And if it hit and ignited, it would burn the flesh off a body in seconds. And that was the fear that they were facing mission after mission. Next slide. Phase three, airfields infrastructure. Conflict hung in the balance. Goring thought he was winning. August the 15th was going to be a real knockout though. All three air fleets, a massive assault. Intelligence told them that the RAF was now on its knees. Luftwaffe 5, with Heinkels and 110s, was going to attack in force the north of the UK. What they did not realize was that the RAF had a resting policy. So he retired up north, battle experienced squadrons to rest and recuperate. And that's what Luftwaffe 5 ran into. They ran into aeroplanes that were not supposed to be there because they didn't exist. And they took a hammering. Next slide. August the 15th, RAF claims 182, actually 75, with 34 aircraft losing to the RAF with 17 pilots. The Germans claimed 101. But the defeat that day first forced the withdrawal, pretty much, of the JU-87 Stuka. Now, overclaiming was something that happened pretty much on all sides during the Second World War. Um, the Americans, the British, everybody, because in the confusion of combat, an aircraft hit by one pilot at 20,000 feet may not have been that badly damaged, can be hit by another pilot at 10,000 feet, and so on. Next slide. The 110 was also reviewed after that and required protection from the 109. Next slide. Another key error. Close escort the bombers, arguments between the German fighter pilots and the German bomber pilots, compounded by Goring's belief that it was pointless to, to continue attacking radar. 
Later on in the war, the Americans made the courageous and very significant step of releasing their fighters, not tying them so much to the bombers. But Goring demanded closer attention to the bombers that handicapped the 109s. Next slide. Courage, Nicholson VC, his aircraft set on fire. He's in the burning cockpit. He shoots down the a 110. He won the Victoria Cross. 302 and 303 squadrons, Polish. As I mentioned, they came in, they achieved the highest Battle of Britain kill ratio, 203, 429. They believed in getting really close to German fighters, 50, 100 yards and opening fire. And they had a desire for vengeance. Next slide. We have to remember, of course, that supporting all of this was Bomber Command, dreadful casualties in France, but they contributed to the Battle of Britain because they bombed the barges that were being readied for Operation Sea Lion. Next slide. Goring's boast, no enemy aircraft would bomb the Ruhr, proved false. That provoked retaliation, which changed a Battle of Britain emphasis. Hitler wanted retaliation and they went after London. And in going after London, they made another key strategic blunder because London had to take it, as I mentioned, 57 consecutive nights and the early day raids. The first one on September the 7th was successful because the RAF weren't expecting them to go after London. But thereafter, things changed. Next slide. And a classic photograph there, Robert Zeb's Dornier falling on Victoria Station. Ray Holmes rammed the aircraft. That was not a suicide trick. He felt he could get away with it, and he did. He bailed out um, successfully. He ended up sliding off a roof and landing in a trash can or a dustbin. Massive raid of London, September the 15th. 185 claims, 60 actually lost to the Germans by a non-existent Royal Air Force. It forced a rethink and a policy change to move to night bombing, which the British had been forced into themselves in 1939-40. Next slide. Next slide, please. Phase four, that focus on London, reprisals, Draw the RAF, they felt that the British would rise to defend London. Yes, of course they would. But it meant that the fighter airfields and the radar stations were spared because London became the primary target by day and by night. Next slide. The 109 we've spoken about, an excellent fighter. But close escort reduced its effectiveness. Fuel was critical, and many German fighter pilots ended up swimming. Next slide. There was no heavy strategic bombing force, as we've mentioned. There was no Mustangs, and there were no drop tanks. And you can see on there the range of the Stuka and the green, and the green line there, the ME-109 could not protect its bombers as a long range fighter escort. It had something like 10 minutes over London. Brilliant though it was, it did not have the range necessary. Neither in fact actually did the Spitfire, but the Spitfire and the Hurricane were defending. They were not seeking to protect long range bombers. Next slide. Numbers, wary of numbers. RAF losses, 1,537 airmen, 1,900 aircraft, 2,662 airmen to the Germans, but be careful of numbers. Nonetheless, whatever the numbers were, the Battle of Britain was a victory for the Allied forces. Next slide. It wasn't a harmony in the upper echelons on both sides, 
but the Luftwaffe lacked the intelligence. They were internecine struggles and very poor leadership. Next slide. The use of radar and the correct policy by Park under Dowding, but little gratitude was shown, unfortunately. Next slide. The Battle of Britain controversial big wing theory, championed by Lee Mallory and Douglas Bader, meant that there was bitter rivalry between 11 and 12 group. Hugh Dowding and Park won the actual conflict, but they did lose out politically. Now, there is a little bit of just a justification to this because of the weakness of nocturnal defences as the Blitz began. But in reality, Hugh Dowding and Keith Park in 11 Group bore the brunt of the fighting and their tactics were, in my belief, the more successful. Lee Mallory and Douglas Bader, Big Wing, would be very effective if you could get it there in time, and sometimes they did not. Later on, of course, and given different circumstances, it would be effective. But at that period, the summer of 1940, uh, my hat goes off to Dowding and Park and all the young men that served under them. Next slide. Now I mentioned aviation archaeology. We're looking at Spitfire now. Yes, it's a tremendous icon. It, it was the victor, aerial supremacy. We forced the Germans into night bombing. 27th of August 1940, 92 Squadron Spitfire number P9548 took to the night skies from Bybury. We did not have effective night fighters. Next slide. A brilliant daylight interceptor. Next slide. But with a narrow undercarriage, difficult to land at night. No radar, the Mark I eyeball was basically all you would have wandering around the skies. Next slide, please. The Hurricane, as you can see, wider undercarriage, but neither of them suited for the role that they were being drawn into, along with Blenheims and, well, very early bow fighters, trying to wander around the skies, hoping to find the enemy. Next slide. 21 years old, Nobby Hargreaves, Frederick, Frederick Norman Hargreaves. He is planning a night patrol over South Wales. That's in the west of the British Isles. He became lost, thinking himself over Wales, which has mountains uh, two or 3,000 feet high. He decided the discretion was the better part of valour and bailed out and found himself in Suffolk, where the highest point is probably no more than a couple of hundred feet. He was several hundred miles east of where he should have been. And you can see on the Spitfire photograph down there, the anti-dazzle panel, because flying this aircraft at night, the glare from the exhausts would cost the pilot his night vision. Next slide. Now, here is his patrol area, all down this part of South Wales. His aerodrome is about there, out he would go and back to base. In point of fact, he ended up right the way over here in East Anglia. Next slide. We had heard about this Spitfire. The police records told us but there was a mistake in the police records and we were looking in the wrong place. We even had, courtesy of the US Air Force, a Phantom F-4 aircraft photographed use its camera equipment to take some pictures of a particular field to see if we could find a spot, a burnt spot that would show where the Spitfire was. Um, that didn't work because we gave them the wrong field to photograph. Then one day at the museum I was involved with at the time, a chap called Dave Hudson turned up. And he said, oh yeah, he knew where the Spitfire was. We yawned thought oh here we go again because we'd been looking for the better part of 10 years anyway dave took us down to this marsh and i wandered along with my detector a beep on a rivet and there was a tiny tiny rivet with a bit of green paint 
then a couple of rounds of 303, and then just below the surface, the tip of the propeller of the long lost Spitfire. Next slide. The same tip you can see on that photograph, and then the back end of the Merlin. Of course, Rolls-Royce, one of the most famous names in aviation and motoring history. For the technically minded, a rocker box cover. I'm not technical. Next slide. And another famous name, of course, the Supermarine on the rudder pedals. And these I've mentioned are displayed at Parham. And Parham is an aviation museum in the UK, which is housed in the control tower of the former Flying Fortress base at Parham. And in those early days, we put quite a lot of different aircraft in there. It is also now the home of the British Resistance Museum. New slide. From the wreckage, we could see the instrument panel, the time of the crash, 12.37 p.m. The poor old Spitfire after Nobby bailed out 395 miles an hour, which not, would not do it a lot of good. Engine revs stopped very suddenly at 3,225. Next slide. We even found the maps in the cockpit. Next slide. And 92 Squadron was penciled very lightly at the top there and the intended course where he was going to go out, do his patrol down here and come back. Next slide. He was going to go down to Bristol, Cardiff, Swansea, turn right and then head for home. And we think in point of fact, in radio contact with his aerodrome, he ended up taking a reciprocal heading and that put him 180 degrees completely in the wrong direction. Next slide. The engine being lifted clear, the front end, as you can see, had been ripped away in the crash. Next slide. Fragments of the Form 700. This would not be taken on an operation patrol over enemy territory, but it provided us with information about the aircraft and who the ground crew were, because we could see Sergeant Oakley's name on there. And when we also noted they had urgently fitted in June of 1940, the um, variable speed propeller, which was also an essential modification to the Spitfire, because we know the Spitfire had problems, particularly the Merlin engine with the carburetor and the Spitfire had fixed pitch propellers in the early days and it needed variable pitch props, which were urgently put in just before the Battle of Britain. Next slide. 92 Squadron, Biggin Hill, 8th of September, back into the thick of the fighting. They had been resting. 11th of September, Nobby, the ex-brewery clerk, he had been to the brewery the week before, spoken to his colleagues, and they'd seen just how absolutely exhausted he looked. He was embroiled in combat with over 200 enemy aircraft. He was never seen again. His family, his mother Anne, had three children. Nobby was killed. Her son in the Merchant Navy was torpedoed and killed. Her daughter, a teacher, was escorting children to the safety of Canada. The ship was torpedoed and sunk. She died. So that sacrifice from that family lost all three of her children. Nobby was no ace. They weren't all aces. Roughly speaking, I reckon there were about 150 RAF aces of various nationalities in the Battle of Britain, but it took many, many others doing an ordinary job like Nobby Hargreaves. Next slide. Dates for the battle, well, we argue. July, August, phase five fighter bombers, nuisance. It wasn't a game changer. Many Germans feel the end of the Battle of Britain was actually May 1941 because they invaded Russia in June. 
So that's something to argue about, but it allows me to include this story. The next one, next slide, please. When Aces Meet, not far from where I live, 17th of November, 1940, within the German element of the Battle of Britain. Two Battle of Britain pilots met in combat. Next slide, please. A future fighter ace, Manfred Beckett Junin, born in Berlin. That's him on the left hand side there, and there he is a little bit older. Count Manfred Maria Edmund Ralph Beckett Junin von uns du Schudenitz. My German is terrible, but no, uh, no matter. In what Air Force would he actually become an ace? Next slide. Well, in point of fact, the clue is Beckett. The Honourable Lucy Catherine Beckett, daughter of Ernest William Beckett, second Baron of Grimthorpe and Lucy Lee. She had actually first married Count Otto Jernin, etc. They divorced in 1920 and she remarried Captain Oliver Frost. And he as a stepdad being ex-RFC, strongly influenced Mandred who joined the RAF and learned to fly in an Avro tutor. Next slide, please. He was pretty good looking, very wealthy, and very successful with women, but very definitely not in his own fast food business. He set up a chain of fast food uh, outlets here called the Hot Dog after he'd left the RAF before the Second World War. Now, it could have been Janine's instead of McDonald's, if you think about it, but it, 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 it never became such because he wasn't any good. Next slide. Flamboyant, he enjoyed very much his aristocratic social life and he met a debutante, Maud Sarah Hamilton, and it was love at first sight. The gathering war clouds saw him going back into the RAF. Next slide. He married the 4th of November 39 and she became the Countess Jeanine, etc. He'd previously flown Hawker Hind biplanes, but he had a sort of personality that was not a bomber pilot. He transferred to fighters. Next slide, please. He fought in the Battle of France. He kidded the younger pilots because he spoke fluent German. They had actually flown ME 109s in the Luftwaffe and then joined the RAF. He became an ace in France, five enemy aircraft destroyed, Others, lots of ground attack sorties. He fought with 17 squadron in the Battle of Britain and added uh, a tally of 19 victories. So on the 17th of November, 1940, he's on a fairly routine convoy patrol when the radio crackles into life and his squadron is ordered to intercept an incoming raid. Next slide. That raid was going against the RAF base at Watersham, and it was the Luftwaffe Specialist Unit, Erflobungsgruppe 210, flying ME110s, and escorted by ME109s. Next slide. They were notorious for low level attacks on British aerodromes. They'd attacked Croydon, they'd actually meant to hit Kenley on the 15th of August, but over Suffolk that day, the British moved 17 and 257 squadrons out to intercept the incoming raid. Next slide. Now, some of you may guess this, but what's the connection to the air battle on the 17th of November, 1940? You'll have to be honest, Keegan's taking note. I'll give him a chance to see if anybody comes in and says who it is. Note the cigar. Next slide. Of course, Adolf Galland, another debonair fighter race. He had his ME109 cockpit modified with an ashtray for his cigars, and he carried that Mickey Mouse caricature on his aircraft. He was a very combat hardened, experienced fighter pilot uh, of JG26 and had fought with the Condor Legion. Next slide. Now the, you can see here the autograph there. I corresponded with him many many years ago when i was writing the story for my first book and piecing together who shot down who in aerial combat is pretty difficult 
but he came back to me with definite times and facts and figures, and we tied the combat together. Very similar, actually, to Janine. Next slide. Later, a leader, of course, of the Luftwaffe fighters, but he clashed with Goring. His victory tally, eventually 104, and number 54, or some records say 57, was Janine. Next slide. Separated from his squadron, Janine went in to attack an ME-110. He thought it was an Italian BR-20 because the week before the Italians had raided Britain. In fact, it was a 110 flown by Werner Nyman, who's down there, you can see there, with the gunner Karl Stoff. And his recognition wasn't particularly good because he thought the incoming fighter was a 109. He hesitated and that hesitation almost cost him his life. He's then hit, the aircraft is set on fire and it turns for the coast. Next slide, please. Gallen saw the 110 on fire and the hurricane coming in for another attack. Next slide. He went diving onto the British fighter, opened fire and one hell of a storm of bullets hit Janine's aircraft. Way down below, two young brothers were fetching their father's horses in for grooming when the battle broke out and the sound of cannon shells scattered the horses, as well as the noise of this hurricane screaming earthwards, and then suddenly thump, silence. But they never forgot the sight and sound. And when they ran over to the crash site, shortly joined by some RAF personnel, who took one look at it and said, don't bother, just pick up the bits on the surface and leave the rest. And they didn't forget that. Next slide. Luckily, Manfred had bailed out, as you can see from that image there, this sketch. Neumann had told Stoff to jump. He landed near the village of Ufford, and because he'd been wounded in one arm, he couldn't put his hands up, he just put one arm up and the soldiers arresting him thought he was giving the Nazi salute, so he was thumped with a rifle butt. The 110 crashed off Albra and the pilot was rescued by the lifeboat. Next slide. But Manfred didn't think the RAF was actually exciting enough, so he joined the Special Operations Executive and fought with partisans in Italy. On his second tour with the partisans, he actually was sitting in a cinema with a German general and exchanging small talk with the general. And the general said, hmm, where do you come from? And he said, London. And the German thought this was hilarious without actually realizing it was true. He later duped uh, Major General Ebeling into the premature surrender of 3000 troops by turning up with four resistance fighters in a taxi and telling the German garrison they were surrounded when they weren't. Next slide. 1950, there he is with his, wife, uh, with his children, but he couldn't settle. 1948, diagnosed with cancer, alcohol and financial problems, died of a heart attack in 1962. Next slide. Gallen fell out with the high command, ended the war, of course, as a fighter pilot again, and became a senior figure in the post-war military. He died in 1996. Next slide. 1969, the two Buxton brothers, Ron and Dobby, arranged the dig. We used divining rods, would you believe? They actually worked. We didn't have metal detectors back then. Next slide. We hand dug over 15 feet to get to the back of the engine and then winched it clear after 29 years underground. It was standing, it had gone in vertically. Next slide, please. And there is the control column and the gun button, and then as found and restored and on, in the museum that I mentioned earlier at Parham. Next slide. So for us, it was a triumph. Ron has since died, so this little talk is a tribute to him but also the airmen involved, no, very few. As far as I can see looking today, apparently in the UK, there is one surviving Battle of Britain pilot. Next slide. 
So, I hope you've enjoyed this fairly quick gallop through the Battle of Britain and what led up to it. Any questions? Thank you, Ian, for uh, staying up with us. I know it's almost two in the morning there, so we will uh, try to speed through some questions here. Um, the first question that's emerged is, uh, you know, hindsight being 2020 uh, allows us to consider what the Germans might have done differently. Um, they came off of targeting the airfields, but did they ever target aircraft factories? And, and if not, why not? Yes, they did. They bombed the Spitfire works at Southampton, but the British were very quickly opening a new factory in the Midlands, which was further away and less vulnerable. They delayed the production of the Stirling bomber by bombing Schwartz works as well. So yes, they had aircraft factories on their list and they hit a number, but not enough to totally eradicate production. Okay, Ian, you mentioned that uh, some of the Royal Navy pilots were, were transferred to the RAF or flew with the RAF during the battle. Um, what did the Navy as a whole do during this period, given that, uh, you know, it was the Germans trying to cross the channel? The Germans had a big fear. The German Navy uh, and Admiral Rader did not want to get involved in a battle with the British Royal Navy. What was key in the Battle of Britain, the Germans needed air superiority. To do that, they could protect both their invasion fleet from the might of the Royal Navy, and they knew that without that, they could not face, they were not up to facing uh, the British um, battle fleets of the time. So their role was peripheral, and in point of fact, uh, the, they were not too keen on this idea in, of invading Britain anyway. Next so question? The, sure. Um, Sorry. No problem. The, uh, there's a question here about whether or not the Germans had ultimately planned to attack the UK, as it seemed that most of the equipment they developed was largely not suitable for it. And in the five years that the, the British were developing plans to defend their islands, it seems the Germans were not d developing plans and, and equipment to conquer them. No, the, the answer there in many ways goes back to the death of General Walther Weber in 1937. Um, he was an advocate like uh, Billy Mitchell, like Trenchard and like uh, Julio of strategic long range bombing. And he was proposing that the Germans should have long range strategic bombers, but he was killed in a Heinkel 70 crash. Uh, and with him, the plans that he had died. So instead of going ahead with this uh, long range strategic bombing idea, and they, they were going to build four engine heavy bombers, they concentrated, they could produce more twin engine aircraft, numbers became the game rather than capability and capacity. Thank you so for that answer. Um, how quickly was the Royal Air Force able to train and replace pilots lost during the battle? That was the toughest part. The numbers of pilots, while it, while it held up, um, the training regime was cut back so that some of the new fighter pilots arriving hadn't even fired their guns. So it couldn't train the pilots fast enough. It took the success and it was, as historians have said, a very narrow margin. And that narrow margin was one because of the courage. One has to look at the Polish pilots, the experienced pilots, and a tremendous debt has to be owed to the Poles and the Czechs who fought with, a, uh, as I mentioned, a bitterness and a tenacity. And we put them into the fray. Downing was initially reluctant because to have Poles and Czechs who didn't speak terribly good English, um, but he realized that there was a cadre there of experienced fighter pilots and he couldn't get enough experienced fighter pilots coming out of the British training schools at the time. So they were thrown into combat in a sense to cover the lack of experienced and skilled British fighter pilots. Eventually, under the British Commonwealth Air Training uh, Plan and pilots training in America, of course, um, 
gradually the RAF built up its numbers of pilots, but at that point in time, they were very, very, um, it was a very, very narrow one race. You mentioned that Bomber Command wasn't sitting on its hands at this time, attacking German uh, staging areas and barges and ultimately bombing bombing Germany itself. Was there any consideration given to, to raids onto German airfields uh, located in France? Yes, they did. They tried frequently because um, through the Battle of Britain, quite as well as attacking barges, they were going after German airfields in um, occupied France and Holland. But the losses were grievous because uh, daylight raids were too costly. The RAF had suffered at the beginning of the war 50% losses in trying to do daylight bombing. And um, when they tried again the, during the Battle of Britain period, if you flew by night, you couldn't find the airfields. And if you flew by day, it was just too dangerous. But nonetheless, they lost a lot of young men in bomber command who were also involved in the Battle of Britain, albeit trying to bomb German airfields. Ian, I think we all really appreciated your look at the, the development of the aircraft and everything that led to the, the sort of status quo before the battle. Um, there's a tendency to think of the Spitfire as being more advanced than the Hurricane, but they are, broadly speaking, contemporaries. Um, is there a particular reason why the Hurricane is such a more conservative design? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned through the talk there, the Spitfire was um, a technological leap that carried additional risks. You couldn't make them fast enough and you couldn't be sure that it would work. The Hurricane was based on the biplane family of fighters, so it, its technology was proven, albeit it, it, what the difference between the two is that the Hurricane uh, really just at the Battle of Britain had reached the peak of its development capabilities, whereas the Spitfire could go on for the rest of the war, indeed it did, capable of being further developed. But it's thanks to the fact that the hurricane was there that the Battle of Britain was won. We've got a question here relative to night fighters. Uh, you, you mentioned them a couple times, and obviously it's something that both the British and Germans struggled with was nighttime operations at this time in the war. What was the first effective British night fighter, and did it emerge during this period? Yes, it started to appear at the latter end of the Battle of Britain and in 1940, the end of 1940, November, the uh, Bristol Bowfighter um, uh, developed from the oh, it's part of the Blenheim family. And then it became. And the British actually gained a worldwide lead on um, Airborne interception, AI it was called, by developing the magnetron such that you could fit radar into an aircraft until then the, equi the equipment had been too big. And so they were the first on that. And in point of fact, I do a completely separate series, a talk on the on the history of British night fighting. Uh, and in, in 1940, it was very weak. By 1943-44, the British mastered the skies and it was a very, very dangerous thing for Germany to try and fly operations over Britain in 1943-44. Was the uh, British decision to attack Germany directly uh, motivated by a desire to actually pull German focus off of their airfields? Uh, were they close to the point of collapse or, or was it just more more fortuitous than anything? Uh, probably more fortuitous in a sense, because we didn't know how the Germans would react. And it certainly contributed to Hitler's anger, uh, the fact that the RAF had the Im uh, impunity to raid Berlin. And that, in a sense, for, helped trigger, I will not say it was the sole reason, but it helped trigger that switch to attacking London because they thought that that could bring the British to their knees. And as I said, in doing so, of course, they took the pressure off the RAF and the airfields. The, the real thing to have done would have been, of course, to have focused on the radar stations, uh, knocked them out, that would have blinded the defences. But fortunately, the Germans completely underestimated 
the capabilities, not just of the radar, but the whole infrastructure that I've mentioned with the observer core, with the uh, RT radio telephone, which allowed uh, direction find tracking of the RAF squadrons. So this combination of different things put together gave you the very first effective ground control interception system. And we've got just time for a couple more questions. Um, Ian, you mentioned the museum you're associated with there is, as featuring a display on the British resistance. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, the British, because we expected to be invaded, we set up what were called the auxiliaires. The, they were going to be resistance fighters who would fundamentally quite literally go underground. We had prepared all around the country and stopped armed bunkers that these men would go into and the German army would roll over the top of them quite literally. And then their job was to come up uh, behind and act as the resistance, blowing up uh, German columns, attacking wherever they could, and then disappearing back into their underground bunkers. And this, um, some of their skill and expertise was later employed in, in France in point of fact. But if you if you get to England, you can see that the British Resistance Museum and the 390th Bomb Group Museum are all basically on the same site. Ian, is that the same as Dad's Army? No, it was a, a more it was a more serious version of Dad's Army. These were the men that they came under. Uh, they, 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 were, they sort of came under dad's army in that sense, but they were, they were trained to murder. Uh, they were trained to garrot German soldiers. They were trained to knife them. They were trained to do all sorts of very nasty deeds. And in, indeed, even dad's army, um, the program is fantastic and it catches the spirit sometimes of, of what was going on at the time. But uh, many of the men in, in, in dad's army, they were, quite serious fighting men and very definitely the bit that was the auxiliaires as they called them um they were no joke they were no joke they were very serious and luckily of course um britain wasn't invaded so the british resistance organization which was kept secret for many years wasn't needed Ian, um, this will be our penultimate question, but um, if there was one thing, be it airplanes, be it the, the sort of indomitable British spirit or radar or any part of this system, um, what was it that, that allowed the British to, to win against what would have been fairly insurmountable odds from the start of the battle? Uh, radar. R radar and the fighter control system. Because... Um, Without radar, you you could not have seen the incoming raids and position to attack them. And point of fact, without the observer corps, because the radar did not look inland, without radar and radio direction finding, uh, homing in on the radio, they had something called pipsqueak on Spitfires and Hurricanes, which was a little device that transmitted for 14 seconds in any minute, and therefore the British were taking homing signals on and triangulating the positions of their fighters and their fighter squadrons by using this. So they knew after the Germans had got past the radar, they knew where their aircraft were, they knew where the Germans were from the Observer Corps uh, report, and they were very effective then uh, on this system of attacking the Germans uh, without radar in that sense. But it was radar that gave you the early warning. So you didn't have to fly constant standing patrols, which would have been ineffective. This way with radar, you knew you knew pretty much where the Germans were and how many they were and how fast they were, you know, what altitude, etc. Ian, our final question for this evening is a personal question for you, which is what does it mean to you as a as a British person looking back on, on 80, 80 years since this battle? Um, how much of a, a part of the, the sort of public awareness is this moment in British history? Granted, some of the festivities are going to be curtailed by the coronavirus outbreak, but, but what does it mean to a British person? Mm. The sad to say, possibly, um, 
there would be many that wouldn't know much about it or of it. Um, I might be doing a disservice to to the to the younger generation there. Uh, but when I was a when I was a young man, fifteen or sixteen years old, every every battle of Britain Sunday, I would be out with a can gathering uh, money for RAF veterans. There used to be Battle of Britain Day uh, air shows at the RAF stations, but over the years, of course, as the RAF has shrunk in size and there aren't the airfields, those those do not now happen any longer. Although there was one big one planned for this year, which has had to be cancelled because of uh, COVID-19. I think because they are teaching the Brit in British schools now in the curriculum, they're teaching something of this history. Any schoolboy probably will have heard of the Spitfire. Well, you may not necessarily know what it means, but hopefully with education, we can remember the well, the men of the few and what, because there's no, in my mind, there's no doubt about it. Had they not beaten Germany and Germany had invaded England and conquered England and Scotland and Wales and so on, uh, and that therefore the British Isles would have fallen, that meant that the whole of Europe would have been in German. And then if you take, just imagine the scenario, if you then say, okay, they then go and they beat Russia and Japan and Russia carve up all of that great chunk there. So that is totally Axis dominated. Where did the Japanese want to go? They wanted to go after America. So, could you have imagined then possibly a two-pronged assault from the Japanese on one side of America and the, the, the Nazis on the other side of America coming after that last sort of bastion of democracy? It's possible, a bit far-fetched, but that's the direct Hitler was planning and they had their New York bomber and they were working on atomic weapons and things. Thank goodness. Uh, they gave up on it. They didn't give up on it, but they they curtailed the program because they thought the war was won. So they 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 shelled many many development plans, thinking they'd got the war won. And when they tried to restart them, of course, they'd lost vital months. Well, that was to the benefit of the Allies. I hope that answers the question and pictures a scenario in there that, that shows the importance. Uh, to the de democratic countries of the world of the Battle of Britain, because it was Britain on its own, as I said, with its with its allies. And thank goodness, in many ways, when America came in, they 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 created between Roosevelt and Churchill the Germany for first policy, uh, knocked Germany out, and then Japan. Thank you, Ian. I think that that does answer the question for us. And I think uh, it gives us all a moment to reflect on the debt of gratitude that we all owe to the, the aptly named few who turned back the German advance uh, during the summer of 1940. Um, thank you, everyone. That concludes our web webinar presentation for this evening. A big thank you to Ian. It is now after 2 a.m. local time there in the UK, and he has no doubt got toothpicks stuck under his eyelids to stay awake for the presentation. <laughs> And a big thank you to all of you joining us um, from here in the United States and hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ian. Bye-bye, Dan.